Welcome to Jim Thompson Art Center. And on behalf of the James H. W. Thompson Foundation, we are very happy to welcome curators and artists and uh, the Candice Foundation from Paris. I would like to, I'm not going to say long because uh, I would like to introduce the curator of the, the exhibitions that we travel from. Manila and Hong Kong. Uh, let me start with Minty Guerrero. <laughs> Colombian artist based, no, not artist, Colombian curator based in Hong Kong and was everywhere, including in the Tates and in Britain. And uh, Cosmin Costinas. Romanian curator based in Hong Kong and in uh, uh, director at Parasite Hong Kong. And next is uh, the artist of Thailand, Julian Siriko. <laughs> and next is uh, Pakal from India. <laughs> and Marie from Cadiz Foundation. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think the if yesterday we have a very uh, nice session with the press conference and I think sorry for you guys you have to run through it again you know, for the audience and I keep the floor to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lydia, and I think it was all like to uh, start by thanking uh, you and uh, the wonderful host, so especially you and Eric uh, who are here for making this um, really uh, an, an extraordinary uh, moment in the life of this project that is very special to us. And it's, it has really meant a lot to know that we're, that we're um, able to uh, introduce this exhibition to uh, Bangkok and Thai audiences. Um, and in the process of actually realizing the exhibition, um, it was extremely smooth and extremely rewarding. Um, so thank you, uh, and then also thank you to your wonderful colleagues, to Tag and to the whole installation team. It was really like a very, very, uh, you know, really pleasant uh, process of uh, working together. Um, so as maybe we should applaud now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Jia yeah, mentioned a little bit, but just to give a little bit of introduction about the project. So it started uh, as an initiative of the of, of, of Cadiz Foundation. Uh, Cadiz is based in uh, San Francisco and, and Paris, who invited us to um, make a proposition for an exhibition that would um, travel in different um, metropolises of Asia. Uh, with the understanding that it would be a, a pioneering project of sorts that would be looking at the ways in which this medium of exhibition making and uh, in particular the sub-genre of the traveling exhibition, how it can um, speak and, and intervene in the realities of our times and how can it make itself relevant in a way to um, the concerns of the artist, but also in the realities that define um, societies across this very diverse uh, geography that we call Asia. Um, so quite uh, a task in itself. Um, and then, well, I guess this is uh, the, the contribution that we were able to, to, to put together with uh, um, under this very ambitious uh, um, scope. Um, the exhibition was first uh, shown at the Museum of Contemporary Art and Design in Manila uh, in September last year. So um, there are the, the image that you can see. Uh, we will show later um, more images of the exhibition as it was shown in, in, in its different iterations. Um, and after that, it traveled to Parasite in Hong Kong, the institution that I'm running. And um, thirdly, uh, it, it arrived here. 
Uh, it's very important to note that uh, this is not just a packaged exhibition that travels from one venue to another and um, you know, scores uh, as many cities as possible, uh, but as part of the in initial intention of the, of the project, uh, we are adapting and uh, developing the entire DNA of the project as the exhibition travels. Um, so this entails many things, uh, um, from the most visible parts of having um, more artists, different artists, um, different artworks in, in different venues, and uh, here in, um, in Bangkok uh, there are several artists that we invited specifically for this show. Uh, there are uh, new work that we included from some of the artists. There are special commissions. There's also like um, um, uh, an intervention in the garden that we, we're very grateful that we were able to, to realize uh, by, by Trevor Young and an and artist from Hong Kong. Um, but even more than this, uh, you know, factual differences in between versions, there is, um, I think, quite a, to, to a certain extent, a different uh, level of thinking about each of the uh, um, stagings of the show. Uh, there are also like the physical and the contextual uh, realities of, of each institution that, that leaves its mark uh, on uh, each version of the show. So I think there's, and especially if we're in, in an institution with the history and also the surrounding reality of this, as the uh, Jim Thompson Art Center, I think it, it uh, brings a very different component and set of implications to uh, the exhibition and to the the core of the artworks that we are presenting within this framework. Um, so I think for the few uh, people in this room who have actually seen more than one version of the show, I think they can um, uh, uh, confirm a little bit that it's, it's quite a changing uh, process. And I think at the end of the day, this also uh, is a uh, proof that for what I've mentioned earlier, that the traveling show is a medium in itself, and, and exhibitions are more than some of the works that are included in them. Uh, there is something about the realities of this medium, of uh, staging works in a, in a given space, in a given period of time, in a set of institutional relations that brings in knowledge and brings in experiences and, and, and ultimately creates meaning that is uh, that cannot be created uh, in a different way. Um, so yeah, this is a little bit for the introduction. I think to go a little bit deeper in what we wanted to do with the, with the exhibition, it would be helpful to um, look at the title more closely, uh, at the title that is admittedly very difficult to remember. We also have difficulty sometimes to really figure out <laughs> which of the S words come uh, in which order? Um, so, yes, um, soil, this is definitely the first one, um, and it's the term that carries uh, the most weight. Um, and we understood it in different, uh, with the different um, uh, possible definitions and understandings that the soil can carry. Um, the soil is in probably its most direct term, it's the, it's the earth um, that is being cultivated, that is the uh, you know, foundation of human livelihood, and it's the beginning of civilization through uh, agriculture, uh, and it's the um, very, it's the, it's the primary source of uh, our food and of, uh, in, still for, for most people in the world, of, of of um, uh, you know their 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 basic uh, uh, sense of, of, of ownership, um, but at the same time the soil is also a can also be understood and it, it's it's implied here as a territory, um, as a given um, well-defined border. Uh, territory that is used for communities to 
uh, define themselves. Uh, and here we're talking in particular about nations which uh, need a territory to define themselves. And this is one of the core um, subjects of this exhibition uh, and something that you know, is very relevant in Thailand, of course, where uh, the idea of the nation, the idea of territory, the idea of uh, where the borders are being drawn uh, around this nation, uh, fixing the nation inside and separating it from everything that is drawn outside um, is an important part of, of um, well, reality and contemporary history. Um, so this was another, uh, a, a second very important um, definition of, of, of the soil, uh, that of the, of, the, of the territory that defines uh, the sense of belonging of a community. Thirdly, and still somehow in relation to, to this, is soil as a source of, of, of riches, as the, uh, the repository of, of natural resources from uh, you know, large-scale uh, industrial level uh, exploitations of, of, of uh, you know, palm oil to um, natural resources of the underground and to the, to the mining industry and to, uh, of course, the, the fossil fuels. So that sense of um, soil as uh, a, a source of, of incredible wealth uh, but at the same time connected to, to the second point also being a, uh, an, another source of defining um, the, the nation because very often nations define themselves also in terms of their wealth, in terms of the wealth that their territory carries, you know, the, the riches of the land, of, of, the, of the beauty and the riches of the land, of, uh, of the overground and the underground as well is uh, but very often gets to be um, used in a lot of like the discourses about who are we as a nation. Um, and you know, fourthly, there is also a spiritual dimension of, uh, of, of defining the soil. And this is something that runs through all the, the previous points that I mentioned, you know, from the uh, advent of agriculture and from that you know, initial magical moment of being able to control what you receive from the earth uh, and, and, and that, that forms the basis of, of most spiritual systems you know, where the fertility of the soil is, is, is um, almost universally some of the most important you know, gods or goddesses of, of, of in, 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 in spiritual pantheons to um, the spiritual component of any discourse about a nation, about um, a you know, community that defines itself in a territory, that there, there needs to be uh, a, a certain transcendental dimension to be able to bind all these individuals into one nation that sees itself also bound to the territory that it occupies. Um, so, if you go through the exhibition, you will see, uh, without a clear separation, but you will see, you know, every in, in, in every association of two, three works that there is this um, oscillation between the, the soil understood in all these ways, in, in, in which I mentioned, and a spiritual dimension, and uh, um, the very practical and pragmatic, and and and, and, and you know. Um, economic exploitation and, and, and measurement of like what can be extracted from a territory or from, from you know, a mine, but then shifting immediately into um, a radically different, into a spiritual or non-pragmatic uh, understanding of the same reality and, and, and placing oneself in the same reality. And I think this explains very well the second, third, and fourth um, words of the title, no? because the remove the stone, the stones also have this um, ambivalence no? of being also very much part of the human experiences in, in the, the, the history of human culture. No? They were the first 
tools that we used as, as, as individuals, they were just the stones, they were some of the first representations of ourselves, but also of gods, of spirituality, came also from stones, from just putting a stone, carving a stone. Um, first weapons were very much stones as well. So there is this ambiguity there, and certainly with the presence of the souls and the songs, the, those creations that need to be uh, sang uh, very often collectively, very often in a, in a very um, particular setting that, that, that makes the, the, the act of singing not an individual one, but one that has to happen in a collective that again defines us as a group. And you will see in, there's a particular section of the exhibition where there are several works from different parts of the world in different moments where um, this issue of singing together and singing in a collective and singing following a very particular script, not just a musical script, but the script of like how uh, both the audience and the singing group needs to organize themselves is a very important metaphor of how we structure societies. And uh, especially in societies that are where, where there's enough anxiety and where, where the sense of self is not, not confident enough and one needs to constantly control and to constantly define a script for how society has to behave. And I think that's something that, well, it's very familiar in Thailand. Um, um, these are definitely, like, I think, important issues. Um, I think I'll let Indy to speak more about artworks. Um, and and um, then to to move to Prabhakar and to Chlayano. Um I think I wanted to mention that besides um, working directly with artists and with more than 35 artists for the show, we also worked with uh, three other curators to make something that we call case studies, which are very much smaller exhibitions within our larger exhibition, um, and they perform different functions. Um, there is in this very beautiful for us space, uh, this long corridor behind the largest room at, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the exhibition space, there is a one of these case studies curated by Simon Soon, um, art historian and, and curator from Malaysia, who reproduced uh, in this case study uh, a very important exhibition for uh, the history of contemporary art in Southeast Asia. That's a 1973 show uh, called Towards a Mystical Reality uh, by Reza Piadasa and Suleiman Esa, two um, of the uh, pioneers of conceptual art in Malaysia. Um, and the show was very important in the uh, art historical narrative of, of Malaysia, and it's in, in the last 10 15 years it, it has also become part of most narratives that talk about uh, the, the, the dispersal of, of, of conceptual art in, in the entire region. And it's, part of it is because of the legendary uh, nature of that show, because after um, closing the exhibition, all the works were destroyed, um, and there was very few documentation left. But for us, it was very interesting because of the claims of the, of, of the two artists, of Suleiman and uh, Reza Piedasa, because they were very much operating in a, with the disjunction between um, what they were seeing as Asian spirituality, which they understood in a very new agey, kind of very Western, uh, pseudo-Buddhist way. They were both actually, you know, Malay Muslims, but uh, there was this projection of like what uh, Asian spirituality was and their understanding of conceptual art, which was very much inspired by the spirit of the 60s. Um, and for us it was interesting exactly because of these two misunderstandings that they were operating with, which we did not want to expose as misunderstandings. Uh, we also didn't want to reinforce them, but I think they were very much relevant with the kind of concepts that culture and, and art very often operate. Um, so, and I think it was also very interesting to be able to actually see the exhibition uh, as it was, because uh, what Simon did together with uh, Suleiman Esa, the, the artist who is still alive, was to 
adapt the exhibition to each of the venues in which it circulated. Um, so you will see that each of the objects in the original show is essentially recreated for uh, the bank of audiences. And then in the beautiful library archive of Jim Thompson, there are two other case studies. Uh, one curated by Chi Chang from uh, Hong Kong that is very much looking at um, these issues that um, I just mentioned and the connection of soil and agriculture and resources and the territory in the case of Hong Kong. Um, and I think that's interesting because it shows the paradox of you know, one of the most urban uh, urbanized metropolises of Asia, but where all these issues are actually very much relevant, and it's also part of part of the reason is the identity struggles that are happening in in, in, in the city in, in, in the era following the, the handover to to mainland China, um, and the third one, um, which is quite a um, it's it's a very rich uh, um, case study with with many references created by. Yong Wu Li, an academic um, and, and art critic from Korea, um, that looks at different stories, different hidden stories that I think shed an interesting light about different histories of, of, of modernizing processes throughout Asia, uh, and very much using stories connected to animals and stories connected with the, with the natural and how that was. Um, transformed or hidden or repressed in order to build different narratives of modernization. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was a little bit of a long introduction of these case studies, but I think it's important because you would be encountering uh, these three mini universes in themselves uh, while navigating the show. So I think it was good to have that uh, explanation of like, why is that happening? Yes, I, um, I'll tell you a little bit of some of the works, but of course the great experience of the exhibition and uh, of encountering these works is by seeing live the exhibition. So maybe I guess this is an opportunity to like share a bit of the process and give you some insight on some of these artists. And, um, on one hand, maybe I wanted to start with one uh, work that is more um, in people's mind's view, which circulated through uh, the communications that, that we did for the show, and specifically the poster and like the official image of the show, which is uh, a work by Sutira Supafarinia, or known as some for many of you. <laughs> Uh, she did a wonderful work two years ago, uh, which is based on her cinematographic uh, representation uh, of a dam uh, in Thailand. Uh, the name of the dam is the Srinakarin Dam. And she uh, had a personal relationship on how the river and land had changed in this part of Thailand uh, because of this dam, specifically how the river, uh, the river's behavior uh, changed and therefore people's life that was related to uh, the river complete, was completely modified by the construction of this dam. Her video, which is a three channel video that you'll see in one of the rooms, um, is uh, a very aesthetically beautiful, but uh, also a big question on the environmental uh, intervention that this uh, intervention of man is having in this particular landscape. And um, it's uh, also uh, quotes through its title, a uh, um, very well-known uh, work by Francis Alice, called When Faith Moves Mountains. Some's work is called When Need Moves the Earth. And uh, uh, it relates, again, yes, to this intervention of man to, uh, to land, which is something that you will see through different works uh, of the show, uh, including specifically Prabhat, who also deals with 
a lot of the murals that he did throughout every uh, presentation of the exhibition uh, had to do with the different uh, ways of representing that um, intervention of mining and um, of different sorts of um, how do you represent what it really means for the earth, the intervention of multinationals and economic structures that have um, uh, extractionist economies and, and economies not to exploit the land. And um, yes, yeah, so there's artists that we have encountered throughout this process. Uh, they're either artists that we visited directly through the studio visits or uh, artworks that we have encountered in other uh, major exhibitions. They're artworks that uh, we have uh, commissioned ex specifically for each show. As you said at the beginning, the idea of this exhibition was not to uh, package it and just have it uh, being hosted by these venues, but really having a dialogue with like specific local narratives wherever this exhibition was happening. And this clearly evolved through uh, the different artists that were uh, integrated to the show. And uh, here for Bangkok, Ranchaya, uh, uh, he did a new, well, he's presenting a new work which hadn't been shown in Hong Kong nor in uh, Manila. His work is also related to the intervention of uh, the waste of uh, different minerals that it are being thrown in certain areas of Mongolia and creating a chromatic, huge spills of different kinds of materials that he takes as part of his work, a sat satellite image, and creates a spheric sculpture with um, some of that material that's being spilled. And um, that work, for example, we encountered it before the exhibition happened. So I guess that was the, what was interesting within the process of how um, like the animal of the, of the exhibition kept on, uh, kept on growing and kept on transforming throughout uh, the process of the show. Uh, also, the architecture of the exhibition uh, completely changed. Uh, you will see when you enter that we uh, uh, reused a uh, space that it was previously uh, used uh, for recent shows uh, as storage, and it's a very narrow space that somehow uh, creates a different psychological space to understand some of these works. And, um, There are some things that may, maybe I'll just uh, yeah, tell you for you not to miss. Uh, on the balcony, uh, the, on the windows of the balcony, there are four instructions which were written by Jose Macera, uh, Filipino music composer, uh, who was one of the most experimental figures of the 1970s in the Philippines. And he is uh, one of the main voices of concrete music uh, around the world, but clearly a leading voice in Southeast Asia. Uh, he was a student of Senakis in the 60s, and when he went back to the Philippines, uh, did a lot of research on the different sounds and the sonic value of um, indigenous uh, instruments from across all islands of the archipelago of the Philippines. And through his research, he created different compositions by precisely not um, uh, uh, creating folkloric music, but actually abstracting the sonic value of all of these sounds, either uh, bamboo instruments or uh, oral music that he then uh, deconstructed and produced compositions with the sounds that came from different songs from across uh, the Philippines. Four instructions appear uh, on the windows of the balcony here in Jim Thompson's house. 
which referred to a composition that he created in 1973 to be composed uh, by more than 300 people. And uh, these 300 people would have some of their bamboo instruments, some of them would have instructions to clap, and we created somehow a display that would um, lead for participants to uh, create his composition. So uh, as you could tell, there's again like a variety of different types of uh, works, either artists uh, from the 70s whose archive is being uh, reinstalled in a way that can be activated to the present or contemporary artists doing recent work that we've encountered throughout this uh, uh, yeah, throughout this process, or uh, Pravaka's work, which has a site specificity nature because his work is uh, literally in murals, and he has traveled throughout with us uh, throughout all venues, and has actually transformed his own work as I guess also how he has seen part of the exhibition happening aside from his own research, and I think that's the. That's a way to give you the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you, Inti and Cosmin. Uh, like, uh, yeah, invite. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. For inviting me for this exhibition, and it's been a pleasure to uh, like work with. Uh, and be part of the, all the uh, edition of the exhibition. And thanks to uh, Pradesh Art Foundation. Uh, like, <coughs> for, for me, like, uh, I would like to uh, like give a brief idea behind my work, like how uh, I started like working and getting engaged with the uh, kind of like mining exploitations. It started uh, like uh, with, with very personal uh, level and uh, with personal background, and it. Uh, like, and uh, uh, it was in 2011, 10 and 11, like when I was looking at uh, my own uh, family background, like which has engaged with uh, the coal mining uh, companies, like since uh, like my, the f one of the member, like the, my grandfather who used to work in the mining was the first person in our family who got engaged in the mining. And, but I was never uh, aware about it like when I grew up uh, with this kind of landscapes but uh, when I was studying uh, in Baroda and then I was like started looking at uh, this uh, kind of issue and uh, in uh, 2012 I did an exhibition uh, where I have uh, used my drawings and sculptures uh, in a very site specific uh, way like it was the first time when I also tried and used my drawings on the wall because initially I uh, trained as a sculptor, but uh, slowly uh, I started using my sculptures and drawings together because I was also looking at the possibilities of the drawings. So, uh, and then in 2013, I started like uh, traveling uh, for the exhibitions. And that's how I got to, uh, like I got the opportunities to see uh, different kinds of uh, uh, minds. Like, so initially it was like a coal mining so most of my like I, I'll, I'll tell you the story like how the work is also was getting like a transform because initially i started my drawings with very black and white uh, like drawings with the charcoal but slowly it was also like changing its forms and colors and uh, also the metaphors that i use uh, every time in my work so like uh, like in when i went to like this in sao paulo for the like for, for uh, 31st Sao Paulo Biennale and I visited the uh, uh, iron mining and gold mining so it was the first time like I see the different kinds of uh, landscape or the situations of the uh, workers I always see that uh, like I always notice that three uh, points in my work like what happens before the mining like and what happened during the mining and what happened like uh, after the mining so I was looking at uh, this kind of uh, like these points uh, since from the beginning. So I was also uh, looking at uh, the uh, situation that we have, like uh, with especially with the labels, like how do they go and what is the situations, uh, like working conditions they have. In Europe, uh, as I seen that uh, there's much more uh, facilities for the coal miner workers. 
because they have like a big uh, industrial culture history also like during the world war or before the world war they have like more engagement and more facilities and also the other other uh, aspect that i was looking at what happens uh, after the mining like what happens to this kind of places and uh, this kind of land landscapes so i found like uh, uh, some examples in uh, eastern and dothmon in germany that actually uh, they have transformed the the mining places into uh, kind of uh, uh, public spaces or museums or uh, uh, like parks or like they completely transform and uh, like where when i see when i uh, compare this kind of uh, situations to other countries or to country of india so i i feel like uh, this is so much uh, drastic like uh, uh, divergence of uh, the uh, situation of the conditions so, so my mo uh, more take uh, about this uh, like mining issues was like it it was transforming each time and it was taking like different dimensions uh, uh, like as my work also does because uh, i don't prepare many times uh, the sketches or even like when inti and cosmin invited me for this exhibition like i wasn't sure like what would i would do in uh, manila and uh, like when i went there like i started my research and then uh, like most of my works uh, deals with the site specific elements so if you see here there's like uh, the image of uh, uh, my work is there and uh, it has this uh, um, air condition uh, like uh, uh, yeah i forgot the word for this uh, air conditions uh, uh, so i don't know uh, air condition tube yeah maybe uh, so I, i it was there in the space so i was interested in using this uh, uh, element in my work so uh i it, it feels like this work is called broken varaha and uh, varaha is the form of uh, uh, vishnu like when uh, it, there is a story in uh, indian mythology that when hiranyakasha is the character who steal the earth the entire earth and he put into the another ocean so i was also questioning about uh, this uh, another ocean like because earth already have uh different oceans already so what kind of ocean he was talking about in that story so and the other hand like uh, i use this uh, image in my work uh, as a manager so if you see that image is like a manager of the mining and who is having like a uh, power like uh, and overpowering the other people so i i turn this uh, story entirely opposite so here is like varaha is like under the feet of this manager and that then there is like is occupying the more lands or islands so it was a response uh, to this uh, like local scenario of philippines how this uh, local mining like especially in uh, northern uh, philippines how and the uh, also the islands like how they are getting occupied by the another nation now so in this way like uh, i was like interested in this uh, slowly uh, like interested in the story uh, of the mythology like indian mythology and it was the first time i how i used uh, the story in my work and another maybe the last uh, i would like to say about the work uh, uh, which i which i did here which is also has a, a similar concern because these are the two works until now i did uh, with this kind of mythical story and related uh, story uh, with the my uh, with the land and also the extension of the uh, territory and in this work it, uh, the work which i did uh, at uh, jim thompson center so it is the relation of uh, and the story of ramayana uh, in uh, context of hindu and uh, uh, indian uh, mythology and also uh, mythology of uh, thailand like how it is depicted uh, in different way uh so i found that there is a different visuals of uh, how they have built uh, built the bridge from india to sri lanka so and i was also questioning about how 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 did they get uh, the such so many stones to build this uh, kind of uh, bridge and 
So in Indian mythology, it is it says that uh, yeah, the bit, uh, the bridge was built with the stones, and uh, it was written uh, Sri Rama on the stone, and then the st stones started floating. So there is this myth, and in this uh, like uh, in the Thai context, like Thai Ramayana context. So Hanumana is like a character who uh, is the important character in Ramayana who becomes a bridge. So I was looking and at the um, story of how in uh, in Ra in Thailand the mask is very important. So uh, it was again like a different aspect for me to see uh, because I don't use in my work like uh, most of my images are headless. So I got this point to like see or take this metaphor in my work as in a Hanuman as in a bridge. So it's a kind of a extension for my own uh, visual language to uh, relate and uh, how I explored the, the subject matter. So you will see that uh, these like uh, small characters uh, which I develop uh, in my work. So there's like this, it, uh, there's trying to like go from the body of Hanuman. It's like crossing the bridge uh, for the next extension and there's also at the end uh, there's a kind of a door which I uh, um, like again bring this from like the from the cartoons like uh, in, in Chinese mythology also in Japanese there's a door like if you open that door you go into another world so I somehow I tried to like create a story for this world so which is bringing uh, another aspect of how how do we do and how do we Start like uh, started. I mean, like doing this extension of the mining. So there are like references uh, for this work. Uh, I mean, like an earlier uh, research and the stories that I uh, did also for the APT uh, Triennale in uh, 2015. And it was a work like the extension, and uh, it was a similar story like how the uh, extension of the mining is happening in Queensland, and also same time. The same company is trying to uh, build their companies in uh, in our hometown. Like it's very nearby, so I, I try to connect uh, uh, this work is like that. Uh, maybe I can show you uh, what I was talking about. Like maybe the uh, uh, images of the research or the places where I visited uh, quickly and uh, some of the work. So uh, this is the place. I use this. Yeah, this is a, a museum. Uh, I mean, like it was a coal mining uh, company uh, from Isen, and it becomes like a museum for uh, people now. Like so, people go there and they see uh, uh, the objects or uh, the resemblance from the mine objects uh, in the mining uh, history and this actually this is very important for me because uh, when this was the first time when I saw uh, the transformed uh, mining uh, areas where they have actually uh, in this picture uh, they have actually transformed the open pit mine like into like amphitheater so it was interesting for me to see this uh, different aspect of how uh, the landscape is also can like the mining landscape also can be changed. So it was like this. And uh, this is in Bothrop, like there's a city in Germany, in northern western Germany. So it becomes like the space like this that where people go and uh, like have some um, like fun, I don't know. And there are also like this kind of places where they have like actual uh, monuments. Like they have invited artists, and uh, they made this kind of um, installations. And this is like another uh, uh, like a story. 
uh, from Seja Pela, the, uh, one of the first gold mining which I visited in uh, Brazil. So I, you see there like there's a pond, but uh, it used to be a mountain. Like it is, uh, it was a 200 meter high mountain and uh, when they got to know that uh, there's a gold there, so, and they were like all farmers around there, and they started digging the uh, like mountain from the top, and they uh, dig entirely around like 400 meter down. So now there is no mountain there, it's like escape of the mountain. Yeah, this is the photo of Alfredo Jar. It's the same mining, uh, it was like happening in 1980 to 1986. Within a six year, they have chopped down the entire mountain. And this is another uh, mining in Minas Gerais, like which is like underground mining, and which also becomes uh, like a tourist place now. And this is a salt mine in Changpeli in uh, Turkey, which has like a very interesting story. Uh, it is a uh, more than 5,000 years old mine, it says, and it's still on. Like, and uh, the when I was talking to the manager, he says that uh, we have only excavated this much. So, if if the like uh, like if this is a mining, so they have excavated only this much. So if all the world would go out of the salt, so they can survive, like all the people from the, the world, they can survive for the 400 years only from this mining. <laughs> <laughs> so this mining was very interesting. They also have this uh, um, mummified, naturally mummified animals inside. So this, is all, this, this was the donkey there and uh, it was like 200 years old donkey. And it, the museum from Ankara, they tried to like bring this in their museum, and uh, uh, though it, because it was like naturally mummified, so it couldn't survive there, so they had to bring it back to this mining. And this is like a maybe ten years old rabbit. And this is the like a soil salt mining. This is the coal mining uh, in uh, India. This is in my hometown. Yeah, this is the map. Like you see, this is the village, and uh, this entire is like the mining. Yeah. Maybe I'll just show you uh, one of the animation which I did. Maybe you will get the entire idea. Uh, of the work. These things. Yeah.
Yeah, so I was uh, looking at the transformation of uh, the landscapes, like how it keeps changing, like, and uh, and I, I was look uh, showing this three uh, dimensions, like uh, underground and also like overground, what is happening and what happens like uh, before, and uh, I mean like during the farming, like farmers have to give uh, their lands to uh, the coal mining companies. And that's how they used to, I mean, like, still they used to get a uh, job for the coal mining. Shall I show you? Maybe uh, now if you want to talk. <laughs> Thank you. So, is <laughs> my next. Okay, so I am. My background is I I, I start uh, film making, like in two thousand two thousand three or two thousand four. So, but in the beginning, I I start as a. Uh, filmmaker. I make uh, many short films and many es experimental film and documentary film. But uh, in in the beginning of 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 my career, I I make. I made the documentary film that related to my uh, memory and my family is about myself. But uh, in around 2009 and until now, um, I changed the what am I interested because uh, in, two, in 2009 there is a big riot, big protest in, in, in Bangkok. So I'm interested in the Thai political situation that what happening in, in, in the Thai society. So in for example, I will show my previous video work that uh, based on uh, nationalism in, in Thailand. So it's without sound, it's around three minutes. Do you need sound? Ah, no, it's without sound. So the title is, is uh, Planking is in 2012 as you see in the video that everyone still standing in the public space and there is a one guy that lay down on the floor <laughs> and nothing moved so maybe you can <laughs> guess that Okay, it's a time of the uh, in the morning, like eight a.m. and six p.m. That uh, Thai people have to stand still for the national anthem. But me and my friend did the uh, public intervention, like lay down on the floor during this period. Mm. <laughs> so it's like sarcastic <laughs> video. <laughs> yeah, it's so I have many questions 
from from the audience that this is uh, illegal or is this possible to do like that? And I can <coughs> say that uh, it's it's not in the law, right? In in the Thai law, you have to stop. But it's just uh, the norm, and it's it's just the tradition that you have to stop. So yeah, it's it's quite difficult for me to to perform in these places because uh, in some in some places uh, some people shout that uh, because there there is uh, the car that park around around the street and some people shout that please drive the car over the guy who laying down <laughs> so it's very dangerous for me but finally it's nothing happened <laughs> <laughs> and as you see in this in this scene in these places is in the Nam Luong, right? And this one is in uh, Tamasa University. So I would like to uh, make a relationship with the political history, like in the 6th October in 1976, that we have uh, uh, like a massacre during the time of the communism. Because, uh, because this time is a time for the national anthem. So, so the feeling of the nationalism in in Thailand for me is is very strong. And the political situation in these ten years, I think, is is a big problem. Hmm. So I have to say something that uh, I made a question that what kind of uh, society that we are living so so planking this video is going to be the good question that that now to 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 that answer to to that question so And after the planking, I I still make some video work that related to the uh, political situation. And for for the video that now is that is uh, exhibiting in 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 this exhibition is called Myth of Modernity. Uh, in Myth of Modernity is uh, I made it in two thousand fourteen. Uh, during during the the uh, protests in 2013 and 2014, and I make the question that what happened to our society. Uh, if we go back to 2013, 2013 we have uh, the campaign to against the MST bill in Thailand because. Uh, uh this amnesty bill is gonna be like it's like to set zero to the politician and or it's gonna be go back to the starting point right but uh but it's uh after when 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 the government uh cancel this amnesty bill but the 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 protest that is still going on. So if if we look at the the planking video, we can see that uh, in in planking it seems like uh, I'm interested in the nationalism, but on the other hand. I mean, I also interested in the political victim from the from the political situation. So, but in two thousand fourteen, it's like uh, 
the, the, the feeling of the nationalism is like come back to our society again and it's very high uh, level of nationalism so if we look for the nationalism in Thailand we can see like uh, three elements like this nation religion and monarchy and if we compare that what happened in the protester who against the government in 2014 so they said that uh, they are nationalists so they call themselves as a PDRC or God Papa Sao. And we can see the symbolic of the uh, element of the nationalism in the protesters, like a big flag, like a uh, Buddhist uh, ceremony, and the image of the past king. So for me, it's a big question that uh, what what kind of uh, belief or what kind of the uh, ideology of the politics that PDRC has uh, believed in. So I try to answer this question and make and I try to understand them. So uh, I, I try to explain by uh, to to bring the idea of the Buddhism and the Buddhist cosmology because uh, in Buddhist cosmology or uh, we call like Chakravan Vidya it's like a, there are three worlds or three poem like a hell human and the heaven I think uh, it's derived from India actually it's like a myth mythology and you can see that uh, in this picture is a tripu manuscript it was uh, painted in 1776 during the Tonduri period actually it's not before Tonduri period even uh, Sukhothai or Ayutthaya and yeah in details like in the hell and the human world that there are four continents and uh, and the human and human is gonna be on the south here on the south of the Sumeru mountain and in the heaven here so if we compare because uh, in the manuscript it's just only two dimension but uh, uh, that is uh, the way to explain the Buddhist cosmology in three dimensions. So you can see the photo on, on the right side that is like a, a three dimension, the idea of, of the Buddhist cosmology. But the Buddhist cosmology is not only in the painting, it's not only the manuscript, but it's also influenced on the architecture, uh, tra traditional Thai architecture. For example, in this uh, picture is uh, Wat Arun. If you see from the top, you can see like the, the Sumeru mountain in the middle, and you can see the five continents that represent the human world around the Sumeru mountain and not only the temple but the cemetery of the king that now is building is also is the same mythology mm. and not only the traditional <laughs> architecture but it's also influenced on the modern architecture in Thailand because uh, because the architect think that uh, uh, when we go like more glo globalization like modernity but but we have to keep uh, our identity of the architecture so 
I have a chance to read the, the article about the modern Thai architecture from the Ajahn Chadri Prakit Notakan, that the, the, the teacher, the lecturer at the Faculty of Architecture in Silapakon University. He tried to explain that the, the form of the modern Thai architecture, which is look like a triangle, as you see in the picture, like a city hall or Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs or the Thailand Cultural Center, why they use the triangle form as a, as a, the main idea of the building because of the because of the traditional architecture is uh, is the inspiration and uh, is like a model of uh, uh, how to keep our identity in the architecture even we are in the modernity. So now I integrate the idea of uh, the belief in Buddhism and uh, uh, Thai architecture to answer the question that uh, why the people of the PDRC is like uh, very nationalistic. So it's become the video work called Myth of Modernity, which is uh, in between like uh, myth, like uh, belief or uh, Buddhist uh, ideology and modernity that we that we, we we have to go to to the future. So it's a mix between past, past present, and the future. So it's a still from the video that I put the computer graphic of the uh, triangle structure with the images of the protester of the PDRC. <laughs> so finally, is uh, I make the heaven heaven of of the protester who in the triangle form and floating into the cosmology but this form uh, is the form of the heaven in in the in the tribal manuscript Yeah, here. So, yeah, in the end of the video, it's gonna be uh, this form with the sun and the moon. So, yeah, it's in the heaven, but in but I present uh, heaven in the modern style. And not only the video for the exhibition, I also create the real uh, light sculpture as a triangle form to install along with the video work. So the audience can feel the feeling of the, the spiritual power that floating over them. <laughs> and you have to look up to the sky, to the ceiling, and worship <laughs> the spiritual power. Okay, here is uh, in the uh, in the Manila, and this uh, installation view from the Hong Kong in Parasite. Yes, that's all. And so. For me, I think it's, it's still, because the Thai political situation now is, is still going on and it's not stable. So, so I have uh, 
many things to keep an eye on and and even because I used to present uh, this work in in the other country and it's quite difficult to explain like the political situation in Thailand to the foreigner to understand what happened but I try to make it easy mm -hmm. so I think we can explain like uh, it's a struggle between uh, we we want to go to the future we have to go to the modernize uh, our country but but some kind of belief that that we have to keep our identity so it's like uh, uh, it seems like we have the problem that in the political situation that, that we we have to going on now mm -hmm. yeah I think it should be for the foreigner it, it can be understand uh, Thai, Thai political situation in in this way I think it's, it's easier for them and I think yeah that's all for me and if you pass Thank you very much for all your presentation and introduction for today. Um, I think we have time for a few questions, so I'm maybe going to start with if anybody has any pressing questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I wanted to start actually by a question to both the product bar and Shulayana, um, because in both of your work that you're presented in the exhibition, but also in uh, others that you presented today, there is a strong relationship between um, maybe question of spirituality and mythology uh, in relation to the political context or at least uh, maybe uh, economic traditions uh, in both India and Thailand. Uh, and I was wondering if you could maybe develop a bit more about this relationship uh, in the context and also maybe because both of your work have been presented uh, for Shulayan in um, Manila and Hong Kong. And also you were talking about Thailand and how it can be read differently um, and probably also outside of India. I was curious about that relationship also. Uh, who wants to start? Maybe please start. Yeah. With, with me, like uh, I always use uh, the metaphors in my work. Like uh, for me, it's interesting to have the story or narrative in my work. So, uh, like, like it was the first time that I already told you that uh, I used uh, this uh, mythological uh, story in my work, which is like uh, like Varaha story and also uh, the story uh, uh, of uh, Hanuman. And uh, for me, it is uh, important, like, to uh, bring out the present situations, or uh, in a way that how like people could uh, narrate or relate. Because I was also questioning about uh, uh, the history or the past, and uh, and also uh, about the beach and about the ocean. Like, like in in Manila, I was questioning about uh, what kind of uh, like ocean was it like when Hiranyakasha bring the earth inside the ocean? So and it was a poisonous ocean. So so when it comes to like the poisonous uh, things or uh, like I was looking at uh, how the, this uh, how it relates to the mining uh, conditions. So on the other hand, I was looking at this uh, aspects of the dead minings or abandoned minings and. Uh, uh, where we have a lot of issues about it, like uh, especially in India, when I look uh, from that perspective, we don't have uh, uh, like places that the other country has it, like uh, the museums, like mining, that which becomes a uh, museum or alternative places. 
So I was also uh, looking at that uh, aspect, like how uh, how I can like bring this uh, uh, like context or subject in my work, and um, yeah. I think it's, it's quite difficult for me to. Um, I think we, even my work is very local. Um, the the content is is very local, but I have to find a way how to connect uh, uh, some elements to the international issue. Um, uh, I have discussed about this. This this issue uh, with many people, and and uh, many people said that uh, in my real work, even even it's it's very about very local, but in some elements, uh, is we we can share the we can share the uh, internationally, for example like. A, uh, nationalism or uh, some kind of uh, belief that, for example, that like cosmology or mythology. Yeah. So, for me, local is um, maybe it's it's not it's not it's not the uh, it's not the the problem so much. So. Uh, because uh, because we we are in the like globalization because uh, with the social media so we we are in the same world that 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 we we are not separately one hundred percent so even it's very uh, local but the audience can connect it to your work actually. Cosmic, you have any thoughts on this relationship in the exhibition about spirituality and mythology and uh, maybe nationalism in some aspects represented in the show? Yes, well, uh, <coughs> I mean, it's a little bit what I mentioned before that there, this is that. These issues are very much related. That that it is the um, the, the 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 gap between uh, stones understood as economic data and and stones understood as a a, a realm of spirituality as something that that you know it's 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 it's, it's really like the the source of our understanding of the universe is much smaller than we would like to imagine. And, and that's something that is also like reinforced very often by political forces because it's very convenient to, you know, uh, it's, it's spirituality can drive economics as well. Um, in pragmatic terms, but also it's, it, it makes many other things bearable as well. And it's a very, you know, in, in a way when to, to paraphrase Song's work, you know, like when belief can really like move mountains, uh, you know, and so that that's that there's a very strong connection there. Um, I think what yes, Inti mentioned that there's a reason why there's a there's a Romanian artist in the in the in the um, main room of the exhibition, Ion Grigorescu, a very interesting figure, active from the 1970s, um, with several works. Um, one more intimate is basically a video, it's one of the also like important art historically, it's one of the first experimental videos in, in, in Romania in the post war era in nineteen seventy. Basically shows himself, a uh, naked version of himself battling himself. Yeah, so it's a boxing with himself. So there's that sense of conflict, sense of rupture, sense of um, inner inner conflict. And then next to it there's another image of also himself um, impaling uh, another version of himself but like writing it. And that's 
one can recognize the Christian Orthodox iconography behind there. That's, that's the, uh, basically an, an adaptation of the icon of St. George and the Dragon. And we wanted to include that because it shows that there is a negotiation of spirituality and a negotiation of spirituality, particularly in a context of, of, of setting a, 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 a difference between oneself and, and, and a perceived Western um, despiritualized universe that is not only happening or to be found in Asia or in, in formerly colonized parts of the world, but also within Europe, you, you can have this kind of um, conflicts and this kind of like disjunction. So it was very important to show this figure, to show that that, that, that kind of um, perceived and, and uh, up to a point real conflict you know, between an idea of modernity and, and realms of spirituality is not something that is uh, you know, only to be found here, but it's it's a condition that is present in, in, in most of the world. That, that, that you know, modernity and, 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 and capitalism is actually like a very thin layer that uh, didn't even manage to completely transform you know European societies in a, in, a, uh, in, in, in its own image. So, and then yeah, I mean, at the very beginning of it, there is this reproduction of. Um, two drawings by this very interesting figure, Gendin Chopper, who was a, it was the, the, in many ways, like one of the first modernist intellectual and artists in Tibet, and he was a Buddhist monk uh, who um, traveled actually to the south, to India, to Sri Lanka, and he became very much fascinated by Theravada Buddhism and the whole tropical manifestation of Buddhism, and he had his own, I guess, exoticizing dreams towards uh, tropical Buddhism, which was quite interesting coming from a, a, a Tibetan monk. And he also had his own um, um, blasphemous struggles with his belief. He also wrote a, a book about yes. sex and sexuality that uh, somehow his family made disappear. He also became quite a revolutionary figure at some point. And the drawing that you would see is also a take on a Buddhist sutra uh, about the core of things, yeah? and, and you see uh, a man after having cut a bamboo tree with an appalled face, and then the writing in Sanskrit and in Tibetan was saying was basically that the man was shocked to see that the tree had in fact no core, uh, and that a core does not exist, which would be, you know, the denial of one of the most important Buddhist beliefs. Um, I don't know if we have time for yeah. So I think we might um, stop end the talk here unless anybody has any questions. Well, thank you very much for coming. We hope you can see the show uh, right after. Uh, it's uh, in the other building in front. And we're here, we're staying here if you have any questions. Thank you.